Hello, I'm Andrew Pearce and this is The Daily Show from the Daily Mail newsroom. Coming up, have scientists discovered a cure for allergies they think they might have? Controversy on Love Island when one of the contestants, he's quit in a row over trophy hunting, which he boasted about. Also, Big Ben, should it bong on Brexit Day, January the 31st? Some MPs say no because it will cost £500,000. I say cheap at the price. But first, the Royals, the row continues with uh, with uh, the Queen giving approval to Harry and Meghan moving to Canada. Have they been forced out because of some form of racism? The debate over the alleged racist treatment of Meghan Markle by some elements of Britain's media continues after Piers Morgan and Dr Shola Moss Shogamu locked horns live on TV this morning after explaining the deep-rooted levels of white privilege and racism to this morning's Philip Schofield yesterday. The public speaker and political commentator, commentator joined Good Morning Britain to discuss the Duchess of Sussex. I've mentioned the racist and inflammatory language. I've mentioned the bigotry. Yeah. I've mentioned the ignorance. I've mentioned the fact that they've been racist behaviour. What you want is to get a cut, you know, fork and knife, and to try and dissect, oh, shall I, you get this example, but, but, but is, I don't see this. Right, and Anila, it's not it my is, job Anila. to educate you. Your job is to Morgan. back up your statements I have with facts. It up, back it up with facts. But you refuse to get educated. You are race-baiting, no, and you are trying to turn the Meghan debate into a racist Divide but this, in this is country, what you get and you're accusing you the media of being racist, racist and it is wrong. So the noises off continue. Joining me now is the author and freelance journalist Radhika Sankhani. Radhika, what do you say to this uh, idea that Meghan Markle was subjected to racist treatment in the mainstream media? So to me, it just feels pretty obvious that that's what's been happening. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of of examples out there from the very first headlines about when, you know, Meghan um, and Harry first got together and announced their engagement. What were those headlines then, Radhika? There's been headlines in the mail itself, which talked about um, calling her straight out of Compton and, you know, talking all about about the gang um, gang violence in the area where she grew up. Well, what's wrong with the, that? What's scene? wrong with that, Radhika? If she'd well, if, if, if Meghan, if Prince yeah. Harry's bride was from yeah. an inner city part of Manchester, don't you think the Daily Mail and other papers would have pointed that out? It's called writing about her background. It's to, it's a profile. You would tell them everything about their background. There's 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 of course there's writing about someone's background and then there's that language that's used and there's the fact that this is a member of the royal family you know and immediately it, it, it goes straight to that language gang violence assumptions made no 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 it's pointing out that she yeah. lived near an area where there was gang violence and then then the piece i remember the piece went on to point out how she'd become a mm-hmm. hugely successful actress nobody suggested I... that she was involved in gangs no, no, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that's the first thing that's picked up on when people are writing about Meghan, as well as the fact that they, they talk about things like her mum's dreadlocks, as, as in these are just things that are always constantly being brought up to show to, to show her as an other, as different. And there's also been comments from people like Rachel Johnson, who spoke about her rich and exotic DNA. There was the BBC commentator who compared... Yeah, and actually, think Rachel Johnson, uh, to be fair... child to a yeah. chimp. Radhika, I think actually I mean, what Rachel Johnson said was how wonderful yeah. it was that this rich culture was being added to a very white, grey royal family. That's what she said. What's wrong with that? But the, but the, the problem with these sorts of comments is, you know, it, maybe Rachel had the best intentions in the world, but it is fundamentally racist to use that kind of language. And, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a brown woman and I yeah. often get these exotic comments and it's absolutely horrible. And it's, it, sometimes it's really hard to explain to a white person such as yourself, a white man, mm. why that's why that's difficult. Um, why that's horrible. But I think it makes you. Go on. It makes me feel, it, it, it feels like we're being fetishised. It's the other. It's this, you know, the, the very word exotic suggests that we are the other and mm. that the white is then the norm. Would you have preferred it then that the media ignored the fact that this is the first woman of colour to marry into the British royal family? No, of course not. I mean, I'm a freelance journalist and I've written lots of articles, you know, talking about how I think it's really 
important and wonderful and to me this really felt like a breath of fresh air and an opportunity for the royal mm. family to to modernize and to, to show that they are mm. that they are you know still relevant today and sure. unfortunately the fallout from all of this shows to me that they haven't done that they've done the exact opposite you see i feel she what her problem is we don't really know but she did give that interview to tom bradby in africa a very strange place mm. to say she was only existing not living a country one of the poorest countries in on the planet but i think what she was talking about there was the royal family i just don't think she likes being part of the royal family and i think she's homesick i mean i think i mean really to me the biggest issue seems to be the way that she's been treated right in the last few years right. the fact that i mean we, we all know we've all seen the headlines they're just constantly no they they're not headlines, i don't i don't i don't agree with you Radhika. i think the crit- i think the criticism she's been subjected to is over her virtue signaling over the environment constantly lecturing and telling us how many children we should have and how important the threat to the to the planet of, of global warming and then she takes four um, private jets in 11 days that's called can I, can I that's called radika radika that's called hypocrisy and it's right that it's flagged up what that but also what, what you're saying there is you're, you're putting all of those comments in her mouth these are also comments that prince harry has made when he did a speech but immediately what everybody does is say oh that's just megan that's just megan and that's another issue i have with the whole way that this, this has been seen which is that it's constantly been seen as megan you know changing harry and it's this really sexist old-fashioned mm. narrative where we're just suggesting that prince harry a prince an educated man in his 30s has absolutely no say no i agree with that i agree with that yeah it is it i mean it's just ridiculous yeah i mean this is a couple who clearly fell in love over shared values yeah they clearly have things in common yeah um and 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 clearly they've both got in common no affection for the royal family currently but thank you for joining us that's radhika sankhani Now, I hope you enjoy The Daily Show. So if you do, subscribe to us and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google or Spotify. And if you want to get in touch, you email me at dailyshow at melplus.co.uk or you follow us at melplus underscore. So Big Ben is under restoration uh, and a public fundraiser could now be enforced to enable Big Ben to chime on Brexit Day because MPs say the £500,000 cost of that one-off chiming cannot be justified on January the 31st. Boris Johnson, no less, has talked today about the possibility of some form of crowdfunding. £500,000, cheap at the price when you think how much governments tend to waste. Joining me now, I'm delighted to say, is uh, Mark Francois is the Tory MP. Good afternoon. What do you make of it? £500,000. Is that such an ex- uh, such a big expense? Basically, they said that they believe the cost of a half a million pounds is prohibitive. Well, firstly, I'm challenging those costs and I've tabled some questions about what was the cost at New Year's Eve and what was the cost on Remembrance Sunday. So I'd be interested to see the answers to those questions. And uh, apparently part of the reason that they're arguing it might be expensive is because they, because of the refurbishment, they put a temporary floor in to help it chime at New Year's Eve and then someone took it out again without even thinking that it might be needed for Brexit. So who took that decision and why? Yes. And as the Prime Minister said this morning, there's also some apparent an issue that they removed the clapper temporarily from the bell and they need to put the clapper back on. But if they did it for New Year's Eve, I wouldn't have thought that was beyond the wits of man. Look, the point is there are some officials in the House of Commons who just don't want to do it. Mm. And it seems that the reason this matters at all is because under Article 50, which you and I didn't draft, this was basically agreed with the EU, we leave the European Union at precisely 11pm GMT on the 31st. So for those around the country who, after all the years of this, do want to celebrate... Just as you do at New Year's Eve, you've got to look to a clock to mark exactly 11 p.m. Uh, was obviously, it's midnight for New Year's Eve. And it seems inconceivable to me and many of my colleagues that that would be any other clock than the most iconic timepiece in the world, a World Heritage Site, i.e. Big Ben. 
I couldn't agree with you more. What do you think? Can you are you can you win this fight, Mark Francois? I hope so. Well, you know, I and other MPs have been agitating for it. We now seem to have the support of the Prime Minister, for which we're obviously extremely grateful. He said this morning that, you know, uh, bung a few bob for Big Ben to bong. Brilliant alliteration. And I understand that some newspapers, perhaps including your own, Andrew, are discussing whether or not they could host some kind of crowdfunding website to allow people to donate. In simple terms, I think that half a million is an inflated figure, but let's say for argument's sake, that's what it costs. That's 50,000 people out of 65 million giving 10 quid. I I reckon we could do that. Nick Ferrari pledged £1,000 this morning on LBC, and if he does it, I've offered to match it. Very good. So I've put my money where my mouth is. And I understand that Michael Ashcroft, while he still wants ordinary members of the public to donate, yeah. is willing to underwrite it if we're short. And that so apparently is Aaron Banks. Very so good. So we should be covered. All right, Mark Francois, well, the very best of luck with that campaign. Michael Ashcroft, of course, is Lord Ashcroft. He's a Brexiteer. He is a billionaire. And Aaron Banks, of course, was part of uh, Leave.eu, who's also a very rich man. Uh, So, uh, and I have to say, I'm going to be writing a cheque, but I'm not saying for how much. Now, listening to that was the Lib Dem peer and former Lib Dem leader, Lord Campbell. Lord Campbell, should Big Ben ring out at 11pm on January 31st? Well, I think this is a bad idea. Uh, First of all, remember that the original result in the referendum was 52% to 48%. And there are recent opinion polls which suggest that it's the other way around now, that 52% of people in this country would rather stay. But the fact is, of course, uh, the withdrawal bill has been through the Commons. It's in the course of going through the Lords. And I don't think this is a moment for triumphalism. Uh, If you remember what Churchill said, who, of course, a great favourite of the Prime Minister's, that one should be gracious in defeat and magnanimous in victory. I think having Big Ben uh, tell us the precise moment at which we leave uh, might well uh, be very uh, uplifting for those who voted to do so, but actually rather depressing for those who voted against But come on, you saw what happened in the general election, Lord Campbell, a decisive victory for Boris Johnson, your own party, which said it would cancel Brexit. Not only did you do very bad, you even lost your leader. She lost her seat. All of that is true. I don't dispute any of that for for a moment. But in the course of the debate in the House of Lords, there's been an enormous amount of concentration on bringing the country together again. And that, of course, has been one of the mantras, one of the several mantras uh, of the prime minister himself. I think this will be seen to be divisive. Look, when you have been successful in what for the United Kingdom is an enormous decision, then I think magnanimous in victory, as Churchill said, is exactly the way to do it. Also, just ask yourself, supposing the situations were reversed, and supposing those who wanted to leave had been defeated, and supposing those who wanted to remain had then decided that they would have a very public demonstration uh, of their pleasure at having won, then I think there would be a lot of upset and concern on the other side of the argument in such circumstances. Now, uh, the people have spoken. Uh, the government has got a substantial working majority. The withdrawal bill has been through the Commons. It's going through the House of Lords. It will be approved without any uh, contradiction or negativity. And let's build on that because there are a lot of issues to be dealt with between now uh, and the 31st of December of 2020. The Lib Dem peer, Lord Campbell. Now, earlier on Twitter, I asked, will you be donating to hear Big Ben bong on Brexit Day? Get those alliterations in there, Ben bong Brexit. 48% said you'd donate. I'm part of the 48%. 52% said you'd rather keep your money. Now, do get in touch by emailing me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or you follow us at mailplus underscore. 
Now he's a celebrity chef, Heston Blumenthal. He's a criticised diners who take photographs of their food to post on social media instead of simply tucking in. He said he'd become annoyed when customers leave the dish to go cold as they snap away. John Elliott is a food blogger at The Food Pundit and joins me now. John, is he right? I'm too, in two minds about this point because I completely understand that a chef and owner of a restaurant um, has the complete right to say whether or not they have people taking photos in the restaurant. Um, but as my stance as a food blogger, I think a lot of people are quite interested to see where I'm eating out. Yeah. Um, most of the time and obviously taking nice photos of really well presented food is is something I quite enjoy and sharing it with my friends, family and followers. Um, And and I'd have thought it was quite a good plug for Hester Blumenthal's restaurants if people are in the one just up the road from here, um, that restaurant uh, if people tweet from that or or take photographs of the food isn't it encouraging more people to go to his restaurants? Yeah definitely and I think people with a certain, certain amount of followers such as myself are they able to provide that kind of free advertising, as you will, to what, what's on the menu? I think it's quite a, a great way to kind of get that that exposure for a restaurant. Yeah. Um, but I have been in certain positions where I have been taking photos within restaurants, and I can see some some customers not entirely comfortable with me kind of getting uh, getting up and going about my business when they've paid quite a high premium price to enjoy an immersive experience. But why does it um, why does it bother them if you're not food criti- if you're not photographing their food? What's it got to do with them? I agree. I agree. I think it 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 depends on the kind of proximity. If you're right next yeah. to a table where you're kind of getting up and walking around within the vicinity, um, I think some people might be a bit peeved about that. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I'm just trying to get the best content I can yeah. to, to to promote my channel in the restaurant. Don't mind. Um, so I don't I mind if it, I, I don't mind if you photograph my food. It's not very interesting. No. <laughs> and I never take well, photographs. I never take photographs of food myself. It has to be said. Um, but um, but I mean, I, I some friends sent me f- f- uh, crisp photos of their Christmas lunch this year. I thought it was rather charming. Yeah, definitely. I think there's there's a level of kind of um, intimacy that people want to share what they're eating, especially big foodies like myself. Um, I have a lot of friends who have a similar interest, and they're quite interested to see where I'm eating of most of the time. It's it's a massive passion point. Um, yeah, I really enjoy doing it. Where are you eating tonight, John? Uh, tonight, I've got a night off, essentially, just staying in, uh, eating relatively healthy today. So <laughs> Beans on toast? Too exciting. Beans on toast? Uh, not, not that bland. I think maybe some sort of fish and mash and peas or something, just something a bit low-key. That sounds very exciting to me. Can I come too? <laughs> That's John Elliott. He's a food blogger at The Food Pundit. Now, coming up, Ollie is the first to leave the Love Island villa this year, following uh, his bragging about trophy hunting and the cure for peanut allergies might be on the way. All that and more after we find out what's on TV tonight with Claudia Connell. So first up, how to steal pigs and influence people on Channel 4. This is a documentary about vegan and ex-vegan influencers, um, some of whom are, are quite mad. They're all people with huge social media followings. So in one corner are the militant vegans. They're the people who sabotage farms and set animals free. And in the other corner are former vegans, and they're extreme former vegans in that they now live on meat-only diets. It's, it's, it's very interesting, but as I say, they are all quite mad. And then Jet on Sky One. You staying out of trouble? I'm keeping it real simple. Work, family, home. Where have you been hiding? Plain sight. Go to the safe and open it. What happened? I got shot. You got shot? I shot. You had a shot. Tonight it's the second episode of what's really quite a slick new series, but it's probably an idea to watch the first one on Catch Up before you watch this. Jet's a sexy female thief. She's just out of prison and she immediately goes back to thieving. This week she's masterminding a heist at a high-stakes poker game. It, it's very stylishly shot and it's, it has great snappy dialogue as well. On Channel 5, we've got bad girls behind bars. Our cameras captured every shocking and sometimes surprising moment of life behind bars. But jail life can be explosive and every day can be a battle to stay safe. You're going to harm yourself. Oh, my God. When good girls go bad, anything can happen. Oh, my God. I'm going to take something. TV executives' obsession with fly-on-the-wall prison documentaries just seems to continue unabated. This series is about life behind the walls of Maple Street Correctional Centre in California. It's a women's prison. 
I mean, most of the inmates have drug issues and the officers have a huge battle in trying to keep drugs out of the prison. But I've mean, just seen it all before. I mean, the schedules don't really need another prison documentary series. <laughs> Well, thanks, Claudia. Now it's time for our regular City Update with Ruth Sunderland, who's the business editor, of course, at the Daily Mail. Now you can no longer gamble on a credit card. I have to be honest, Ruth, I didn't know you could. Yes, well, you can. Um, and it's very dangerous, as you can imagine. Mm. So, obviously, there, there would be people who use a credit card to gamble for the convenience, and it's it's no big deal for them. But there's quite a staggering statistic that over 20% of people who use their credit card for gambling have got a problem an addiction problem and that is quite serious because gambling as you know Mm. can absolutely ruin people's finances wreck their family lives Mm. and really cause some awful mental health issues so who's banning it is this a government thing or is it an industry thing yes so it's a government thing so it's being banned across the board so you will still be able to use your credit card to buy a lottery ticket but that's it it's online offline you know, across the board, you cannot use your but credit I suppo- card But I suppose if you're a determined gambler, you'll find another way to do it. Well, you can still use your debit card. Ah. Um, now, of course, that is limited to your... How much over- you've got in the how bank. How much you've got in the bank, plus, yeah. plus your overdraft limit. Um, you can obviously still, you know, go into a bookies. You, you know, people will always find a way to gamble. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting that the statistic that I mentioned before, that people obviously were using their credit card and perhaps multiple credit cards. Mm. So it, it, I think it will be a, a curb on people. Yeah, and I only I saw my credit card the other day. I noticed my limit on my credit card, £27,000. Yeah. I never agree to that. I know. It's astonishing. Well, th- you, you, you often get a limit set and they put it up without you even yeah. realising if you're not a they habitual user. Well, I pay, user. It back, I pay it back every and month yes, anyway. Yes, you see, I do that. Now, that's a very good personal finance tip there. If yeah. you, for what, Even if you're not gambling on your credit card, even if you're just using it, always, if you can, mm. pay it off and try to pay... If you can't pay it off all at once, pay more than the minimum. Now, you're absolutely right that the limits on them can be very high. And, of course, people can have more than one credit mm. card. So if you're just gambling on your debit card, you are limited. Your yeah. bank is going to call time on you. But you might have, you know, four or five different cards. I've got, I've got three cards... I only use one, but I have the other two just, you know, in case there's an emergency. Very, very interesting. That is Ruth Sunderland, business editor at the Daily Mail. And, of course, Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood's here with the latest. Bushfires playing havoc with the Australian Open. That's the tennis, is it? It is indeed, yes. They're in oh. qualifying at the moment for the Australian Open, which starts in a, in a week's time. Is it in Melbourne? It's in Melbourne, yeah. And these bushfires are, across Victoria are causing havoc. So this uh, overnight, obviously, when they were playing in these qualifying events, some of the players were going down, actually physically bent double, coughing, spluttering, uh, saying they were unable to go on. One, one girl actually pulled out of a game saying that she couldn't go on. So incredibly... They've been made to go out there. And now, you know, you think of tennis players as being, well, they've got loads of money and it's, mm. it's all fine for them. But some of these guys in qualifying, in the first round of qualifying, actually don't make a huge amount of money uh, throughout the year. That's why they're in qualifying. Mm. And they're kind of complaining that they were just being shoved out there and told to get on with it. Uh, a couple of British guys as well, uh, Jay Clark and Liam Brody, were complaining of feeling of feeling terrible while they were playing. So there is indoor facilities. They went indoors to try and see if they could play in the indoor facilities, but the vents on the wall were open and the smoke was coming oh. in and it was just as bad indoors. So it's a bit of a farce. And they closed the vents. Well, I'm not sure they can. I think these vents must be built in order to let okay. air in, con- you know, right. to, to let air in constantly because yeah. it's in Melbourne because it's hot. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, mm. but I think that must be the case. Yeah. So, they're in a real quandary if they can't get this qualifying done before the tournament starts and indeed they're in a quandary if the tournament can't go ahead now the weather uh, the weather forecast is for actually it's cooled down the next couple of days so mm. it may be that they can get back to normal but pretty shocking scenes overnight amazing and uh, football betting scandal talking of betting what's we, the latest indeed well a very interesting story exclusive story that we uh, that we've run is that football clubs a lot of football clubs and a lot of Premier League football clubs have um, betting firm sponsorship deals on their shirts. So, for example, West Ham have Betway on their shirt. Right. Now, we, we've been to a lot of these clubs and sort of said, why do you do it? You know, should, should you be doing this? Is this the right thing to do? You've got children in the audience, etc. Should you be promoting yeah. uh, gambling, as just discussed, is a problem amongst lots of people. And they've basically sort of off the record said to us, well... 
we can't afford not to because the next best offer we get can be as half as much in terms of finances. Hey. And if we want to keep in touch with the kind of big six clubs mm. who don't have betting contracts because they can afford with the Emirates or whatever, yeah. they say, you know, if we if we were to not take this this coin, we would get cut adrift even further from kind of the big uh, the big money clubs. So the ones who are bringing in the Champions League money, etc. So they can they will argue, well, what are we meant to do? So very interesting story. Yeah, it is vicious cycle, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and what's happening in cricket? So in the cricket, it's a, it's a there was a bowl off between uh, Mark Wood and Jofra Archer for who's going to take the last place in the England team. And it looks like Mark Wood is bowling quicker, looks fitter, and it looks like he might win the selection race ahead of Jofra Archer, who was the star of the show last summer. So interesting that he already might have fallen from uh, fallen from the team. The Test match, you think we're going to lose? The Test match, I think we're going to lose. It's not very encouraging to say <laughs> that, is it? That's Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood. Now, do email me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or you follow us at mailplus underscore. The contestant Ollie Williams has quit Love Island uh, following a petition signed by more than 17,000 people after photos of him posing alongside dead, endangered animals emerged last week, trophy hunting. The self-proclaimed heir to a stately home in Cornwall made his debut on the dating show on Sunday evening, but now deleted photos saw him posing alongside a dead warthog, water buffalo and giant a land. How sad is that? Join me now is John Cooper QC, who sits on the board of the campaign to ban trophy hunting and is the former chairman of the League Against Cruel Sports. John Cooper, you must be delighted he's gone. Well, uh, I, I'm pleased he's taken that decision. Uh, it was very concerning when those photographs came out, particularly in the light of the, the, the present uh, massive concern both in the country and expressed by politicians. I mean, the government are currently holding a public consultation on whether the import-export ban on trophy hunting uh, should be implemented. And uh, an overwhelming number of people in this country uh, want the ban. I think a recent surveillance poll said 86%. I'm, I'm, uh, it's astonishing, frankly, John, that, that it's not banned already. Well, it is astonishing. It's, it's banned in, in many other countries, for instance, Australia, France, the Netherlands, and, and even in the United States, as far as import-export bans are concerned. It, it, it is staggering when one looks at the, the reality of this so-called trophy hunting. It's, it's not even a sport. Or it's, it's a one-sided hobby, if nothing else. And again, I'll give you some just brief facts. I'm yeah. Here, uh, in, in Britain, trophy hunters brought home about 5,000 so-called trophies of threatened species since the 1980s. And uh, really? the, number of, uh, uh, you know, the number of captive-bred species uh, uh, being shot has trebled. We're talking about lions, leopards, zebras, bears and rhino. Uh, and, and it's staggering to think that when we're looking, for instance, just at lions, uh, statistics say that this could be the first big cat to become extinct since the prehistoric saber-toothed tiger. And these, these animals are being shot just in the name of bringing home a trophy. It's, it's staggeringly cruel and, 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 and wasteful. And, and also, if one wants to be practical about it, it's damaging to the environment as well. Because when these species are effectively on the verge of being wiped out, are wiped out or diminished, the prey that they, 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 they hunt for their own food is, is affected, species overgraze, water systems mm. close down, and, and the knock-on effect of the environment is, is an appalling story within itself. Well, John Cooper, best of luck with that campaign. Um, I think everybody listening to this will be on your side. That's John Cooper QC, who's on the board of the campaign to ban trophy hunting. Can we please just do it? <laughs> So last week, the Soho House chain of private members clubs announced it's banning all nuts from its kitchens to protect customers from potentially deadly allergic reactions. It's thought to be the first English chain to ban nuts entirely. Today, we're asking if that's ultimately the best and only way to completely eradicate any risk to consumers. Joining me now to help answer that question is our very own Lucy Elkins, writer for Good Health. Lucy, um, are others going to follow suit, do you think? I think they will eventually, yes, because I think there's quite a big public appetite for this, no pun intended. Um, you know, an awful lot of people have allergies. We're talking about millions. 
And uh, having a food allergy can make life very, very complicated. You have to be so careful about what you choose to eat. You have to be careful when you're in the home, when you're buying things to eat at home, and even and when you're out and about. So it's a very, very complex area, and I think measures like this can make life a lot simpler for those affected. And um, British researchers, haven't they announced um, early trial results of a peanut allergy jab? So effectively, we could be vaccinated against it. Yes, this is, this is quite early research, um, and this has been three years in the making. The problem is that to combat allergies, you need to tinker with the immune system. And obviously, you need the immune system in tip-top condition to protect you from everyday infections and everyday diseases. So you can't tinker with it too much. But yes, they are quite excited about some early results being presented this month, um, and uh, which they say could be um, you know, a good game changer for people with peanut allergies, which does remain the most common allergy. But we're some way away from being able to actually give these people, give people these um, jabs yet. And some, I mean, the peanut allergy can potentially be lethal. Oh, it can be, you know, it, well, any food allergy, if you have it seriously enough, can have the most devastating effects. You know, we've read in the news about young people who have died. And um, I was looking at the website of um, one young lady who was affected, Amy May Sheed. You know, she had a bright and brilliant career. And through no fault of her own, she took a mouthful, just a tiny nibble of something in a restaurant in Budapest. And her reaction to what was in that was so strong that her heart stopped beating for six minutes. And as a result, this beautiful, amazing woman is now in a wheelchair and unable to speak. So people can be um, a little bit dismissive of food allergies, I think because there has been um, a lot of noise about people with intolerances, um, people who say they can't ingest this and they can't deal with that and it gives them a bit of bloating. A proper food allergy is a really unpleasant thing and is potentially life-threatening and we really shouldn't lose sight of that. And, and just finally, Lucy, what advice do you give to people who uh, maybe they don't even know if they've got allergies or, or, or should, I mean, if they go to restaurants, should they always ask about peanuts, that sort of thing? Yes, they definitely should. I mean, people generally know whether or not they have an allergy. As I say, you know, um, the symptoms of a proper allergy are normally quite extreme and quite obvious. But yes, if somebody doesn't ask you, then for goodness sake, make claim that you have an allergy. Put Put it, you know, put it out there and say, I have a serious allergy to this. I have a life-threatening allergy. Please, can you tell me if it is safe for me to eat this? And um, I think most people do in this country certainly do take that seriously. But it's certainly worth emphasising before you sit down to enjoy a meal. Sound advice from Lucy Elkins, who writes for our very own Good Health pages. That's all we've got time for today. For the latest from the Daily Mail News, we come back every day for briefings at 7am at 12 noon and, of course, 5pm, where you can listen to me all over again. That's all from me, Andrew Pierce from The Daily Show. I'll be back tomorrow. Have yourselves a great evening and good night. Good night.